Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'd like to get everyone to stand with me for a moment, please. Hallelujah. I want to welcome the senior partner of this ministry here today, the overseer of this house, the teacher of this organization, my best friend, the Holy Spirit. We welcome you, sir. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you, Spirit of Truth. Now open your heart and ask Him, Spirit of Truth, today I submit my heart, my mind, my body, my will, my emotions to your control. Move inside me. Reveal God's word to me. Reveal the kingdom to me. I pray God's kingdom come in my life, in my home, my family, my church. I pray your will be done in my life, in my home, in this church. And we pray this in Jesus' matchless name. We open our hearts to your word. Lord, like a surgeon, do a heart transplant in us today. In Jesus' name. We welcome you, Spirit of God. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. We've been talking about prayer the last couple of weeks, and I can only hope that you've been experiencing the same revival in prayer that I have. If you haven't, all I can say is, man, you're missing a good time. It is the most incredible thing to be in the presence of God. In fact, I got to tell you, over the last several weeks, I'm finding myself so caught up in the presence of God, I just don't want to come out. And as I get more and more and more in the presence of God, I want to be less and less and less in the contrast of this world's culture. I really want the kingdom of God. I really want the kingdom of God. There are times where my mind my heart, my soul start moving worldly. And in those times I wonder about, you know, death. And I can even sense at times the fear of death. Again, the sting of the grave. And I wonder about the times that I know are coming on the earth. I read the book of Revelation again last week. And as I read it, I just wanted to be sobered. You know, there's so much, we used to call it in the 80s, greasy grace. I don't know what we call it now. Some of it's just flat lies. But there's so much stuff being preached today that there's no, you know, severity of God being ministered. And so as I read the book of Revelation again last week, I said, Lord, sober me to what's coming on this earth. And brother, sister, I was sobered. I found myself, by the time I got to Babylon, has fallen. As I worked my way through the trumpet judgments, the bold judgments. As I read about the things that are about to come on this earth. I found myself saying, even so, come Lord. Come Lord Jesus. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. His will will be done on this earth 
and every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess. You can do it now voluntarily, or you'll do it right before you're cast into the lake of fire with the devil and his angels to be tormented forever and ever, day and night. The worm don't die, the fire's not quenched, the judgment will never end. You'll enter the eternal prison as an eternal criminal. You can't die because you're made in the image and likeness of God, so your punishment will be forever. You cannot cease to exist. Can't happen. You're eternal. So there has to be an eternal prison for an eternal criminal, and that's called the lake of fire. And even hell, death, and the grave will be cast into that place, the Scripture says. Very sobering. We started in Matthew 19 talking about these children, and I want to continue. And this morning, I want to just talk about living. Well, first of all, entering, and then living in the kingdom of God. Last night, as we were ministering about life in the Spirit, I made a statement. Everyone that is born again has a regenerate spirit. Everyone who is born again has a spirit that has been made new by God, but everyone who's born again is not spiritual because that spirit must be developed. And just as a, these little babies all have to learn to walk and talk and they'll begin by doing little gestures and as their little brains begin to connect the dots and they begin to understand, you know, this is good, this is not good, this feels good, this doesn't feel good, this is how you walk, this is how you talk, this is how you understand. As all that happens, when we're born again in the Spirit, the Scripture calls us little children, little babies. And it's just as important for us to develop our spiritual lives as it is for these little babies to develop their natural lives. And imagine, if you would, you know, the average, they just changed the statistic in America. They used to say the average Christian attends church, blah, 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 you know. But they had to change the statistic because church attendance has diminished to the point. So now when they say average Christian, they're no longer saying the average Christian attends a religious worship service once a week. That used to be the standard by which these statistics were measured. They changed the bar. And what they say now is the average Christian, the word average Christian now means a Christian who attends a worship service once a month. So the average Christian in America has went from once a week to once a month over the last several years. And then we have the, what we call the ho-hop Christians. It's not hip-hop, it's ho-hop. The ho-hop Christians. The ho-hop Christians are, Chris, you know, C and E believers, Christmas and Easter. Now imagine if you would... Because if the kingdom of God has to grow inside of us and if we have to gain and begin to learn to walk and move and live and have our being in Christ, if it is like a regrowth, imagine if these little babies, now let me say this too, the average Christian who attends once a month attends for one hour because the average church service in America is one hour and of that one hour the average time of the ministry of the word is 15 to 30 minutes and then half of that isn't even the word half of that is logic half of that is not even the word so imagine if one of these little babies would say I tell you what I'm only going to spend 15 to 30 minutes once a month learning to be a human being what would they look like at the age of 30 they would look like in the natural what most Christians look like at the age of 30. In the spirit. The average Christian don't know their Bible. They don't read their Bible. They don't pray because they don't know how to pray even though they've been going to church most of their lives. They don't have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. They don't even really know if he's there. They can't tell you when he's speaking or not speaking, moving or not moving. They don't have spiritual sensitivity because their senses and the spirit have been dulled by the carnality of their own lives. This is a fact. This is the condition of the American church. And I would love to see reformation. 
I would love to see reformation. When something gets deformed, it has to be reformed. And there's a grave deformity going on, I believe, today in the body of Christ. I have many friends who travel and minister, and they're coming back to me saying, David, you don't understand what the condition of the churches are. Pastor Brian is traveling around the world, and he's going into churches, and he gives an altar call for salvation. And he said 90% of the church comes. And he says, no, 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 you guys misunderstood me. This isn't an altar call for Christians. This is an altar call to get saved. And 90%. Of the Christians are coming to get saved in an altar call. He was just in a church in Texas where the pastor came to get saved. Churches are being led by people who are so carnal. You know, we've had a standard in this ministry since 1986. We wrote down some standards for leaders. And 1986, that's 27 years. And in 27 years, only in the last 12 months have my standards been contested. Because I've got people coming up saying now, no, I'm not doing that. You change it if you want me to lead. Standards are being contested. I don't have any problem being contemporary with the gospel. You can see that, right? We have no problem being contemporary of the gospel. We have no problem presenting the gospel in a language people can understand. But I have a problem when we start calling good evil and evil good. Let's look at verse 16. Matthew chapter 19. Now behold, one came to him and said, Good teacher, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? There is no one good but one, and that is God. So why did Jesus say that? He was God, right? So why did he say that? Because the man didn't come to him saying, Son of God, he didn't come to him saying Messiah. He didn't come to him acknowledging him as God. He came to him acknowledging him as a teacher. Earthly title. Jesus said, well, if you're only acknowledging me as a teacher, let me tell you, there is no good teacher. There's only one who's good, and that's God. But if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. So he said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder. Check. I mean, I'm sure most of us in here haven't killed anybody. I've never personally killed anybody. I, at one point in my life, could have saved a life and I chose not to. But I didn't physically pull a trigger. I didn't physically shove a knife into somebody's heart. Most of us say, I'm okay. You shall not commit adultery. Well, I pray to God this morning you all aren't doing that. And I'm sure your husband or wife hopes you're not doing that. So most of us will go, You shall not steal. Well, again, I hope that's not you. You shall not bear false witness. Lie. Honor your father and mother. What do you mean honor? (laughs) We always want to define things. And then we change definitions to fit our desires. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Ah, most folks trip right there. If you made it through the whole list, that's a tough one. So the young man said to him, all these things I've kept from my youth. But why did he believe he lacked? You know, we are too great 
in the level and the plane of creation. We're too great to be satisfied with any other thing than the truth and he who is truth. And so no matter how great, how good, how wonderful we think we're doing, if we're not walking in complete righteousness of Jesus Christ by faith, we always sense that I'm lacking some. We always will. Jesus said, you want to be perfect? Go sell what you have and give it to the poor. And you'll have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. This morning I have a question. What's holding you back? From your next level in Jesus Christ. Because he's only asking really that thing for you today. He's only asking the thing that you don't want to give up. He's only asking for the thing that you want to keep that's between you and him. Because he said many, many centuries ago, millenniums ago, he said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Anything that stands between you and I, I require of you this day, says the Lord. What is that? Well, I don't know. Every man's heart has its own idols. When his disciples heard it, they were astonished, greatly astonished. Everybody do this. <gasps> That's what they did. Why? Did you hear what he said, Peter? Andrew, dude, did you hear that? <laughs> Saying, who then can be saved? Man, Jesus seemed to present at times a standard that no man could reach. His disciples were like, oh, how can anyone do what you're asking them to do? How can it? It's not even possible for us to do that. And Jesus looked at them and said, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. You see, when you take man and you divide him from God, you are in the realm of impossibility. You never can do all he calls you to do. You never can be all he calls you to be. You never can fulfill the righteous requirements. The, the scripture goes on to say, if your righteousness does not exceed the righteousness of of these holy men we call scribes and Pharisees. If your righteousness isn't greater than theirs. There's no way you can enter in. With men it's impossible. The holiest men in Israel. Jesus said can't get in. But with God all things are possible. That's why we pray. We don't pray to We, we don't pray, Lord, my life will measure to meet your expectations. We pray, your, we, we, we pray this, your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. See, my will is always going to be compromised. But what happens when he moves inside and now my will is shifted to become his will. Now it's possible. Why? Because it's no longer I who live, but Christ who liveth in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. So it's no longer just Dave trying to make this thing work. Now it's Christ in Dave. The hope of glory. And all of a sudden, my eyes pop wide open. And I begin to see the kingdom. Amen. Now at any given time, I can step in or I can step out of the kingdom. At any given time, I can press in 
or I can be pressed out of his will. Because I moved into the kingdom does not mean I remain in the kingdom. I've got to stay in the kingdom. We don't, you know, obtain the kingdom. We obtain the kingdom. It's not by our own works we enter. It's by accepting his works. Matthew 18 verse 1. At that time the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Oh, that's always a problem for us, isn't it? There's people here this, not here this morning because they thought they were greater than they were acknowledged. There's people all over the world who God, you know, in, in, their, their greatness wasn't realized, so they went another way. Every time the disciples were fussing, Jesus would come and he would say, what, do you, what, what, what are you fussing about? And it was always the same thing. Who was going to be greater? Always the same thing. There was some disciples even got their mom involved in it. Hey, mom, go ask Jesus if we can be greatest. So she came to him and she said, Lord, I ask this for you, from you. My two sons, when you come in your kingdom, let one sit at your right hand and one sit at your left. And Jesus said, you don't even have a clue what you're asking for. Are you able to be baptized with the baptism I'm to be baptized with? And these two brothers said, absolutely. And I'm sure he shook his head as he said, oh, you will be. But to sit on my right or left is not for mine to give. But it's already been determined by my father. Man, we got to be careful what we ask for. It's not an easy walk to walk out in front in the kingdom. It's not an easy walk. Jesus called a little child to him and he set him in the midst of them. And he said, assuredly I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little Children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, how do I enter the kingdom of heaven? Before I can live there, I've got to get in. you got to be converted. you got to become like a little child again. you got to flush everything you know and learn again. You've got to become as trusting with your father as your little child is with you. You know, when I went to sleep last night, my little grandson laying there beside me, he didn't say, Papa, am I going to get to eat tomorrow? Huh? He didn't say, Papa, will someone be here to take care of me when I wake up in the morning? No, man, he's just like a little kid. He ain't got a care in the world. He trusts that his parents... And his grandparents and his great-grandparents, he trusts that they are going to take care of him. He, he's not running around playing with Alex or playing with Jocelyn, thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. What? Will God pay our electric bill this month? He's just trusting. Jesus said, you've got to be converted like a little child. And you know, when he asks questions... And I give him the answer. He doesn't Google it. <laughs> he probably will here in a couple of years. But right now he just believes me. We were talking last night. And, and uh, I said, you, got, you ready to pray? And he said, yeah. And so we start praying. And I said, bless my younger sister. And he stopped me. He said, Papa, what's younger? And I said, well... You're younger than me. Your little sister's younger than you. It means she's not as old as you. He didn't say, well, let me go get a dictionary. And I'll find out if you're telling the truth or not. He just trusted me. And you know, the father, he just wants us to trust his word. He just wants us to look into his word and trust it like little children. 
There are so many skeptics in the church, and they don't realize the very, the very fact of their skepticism. They're in the church, but they're not in the kingdom. Because you can come to church and not be in the kingdom. The kingdom, the scripture, well, I don't get ahead of myself here. Assuredly, I say, unless you're converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever, now here's another spiritual alignment, humbles himself. As a little child, when does pride manifest? When does pride, on an evil sense, because there is pride that is not evil. But pride in man begins to manifest as children begin to grow, especially in puberty. We watch our children in children's ministry. And I'm telling you, they have no pride when it comes to worshiping the Lord. And then one day, one of them's taking a shower and bing, he sees a hair under his arm. And all of a sudden, he comes to worship and he's like, there's a girl over there. I wonder what she's thinking about me. I ain't doing that no more. And we watch our children move into pride of life especially in that pre-adolescence and adolescence we watch them move into the pride of life and then we have to convert them again and some some of our, our youth make it through the conversion I watch some of our youth now when they were 9 or 10 they were dancing and praising God and now they stand on the back wall like I'm cool I'm cool are you cool? I'm cool Oh, we ain't doing that mess. Well, most of the time, we get them out to youth camp or somewhere, and then we reconvert them back into a state of humility. But they're walking into pride of life now, like y'all, like most of y'all. You know, you try to lead an adult into true worship in America. You know what the word worship means? Look it up in any concordance you want. Proskuneo. Here's what the word worship means. When you read your Bible and it says worship the Lord God, here's the meaning. True worship always manifests in bodily posture. True worship is not saying, I'll stay in the room while you sing about Jesus. True worship is manifest in bodily posture. Proskuneur, to prostrate oneself. In the Hebrew, it means like a dog laying at the feet of his master. Licking his master's hand. That's what the word worship means. But we've, we've redefined it because we're not going to do that. We're too proud. You know, the average church person comes into a worship service like ours and they look around and they think we're mad. They think we're nuts. Because they see people, you know, you read the book of Psalms, which is the book of worship. And it tells you about all these bodily postures, clapping of hands, raising of hands, shouting, jumping, twirling. You know when it says Jesus, after he discipled and sent the 70 out, and the 70 returned and said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. The scripture says Jesus rejoiced in the spirit for an hour. The word rejoice, look it up, man. Here's what it means. It means to jump and twirl and dance. Look it up. It wasn't a mistranslation. Why? Because everything he did just worked. He knew his kingdom had come. Why? No one had ever walked with authority with demons. Not since the Garden of Eden. 
No one had ever commanded unclean spirits. And they obeyed. And he rejoiced. He danced. He leaped. He twirled. For an hour. Read it. We come to church. We're like... We used to have a cliche for that. It's called the frozen chosen. <laughs> but you know what it is? It's pride, guys. It's pride. Oh, I remember when I came into a bunch like this. I remember, man. It, I was like, I ain't doing that. And then one day it hit me. I, I remember standing. I remember the day it happened. I was in the, sitting in Pastor Bob Nichols' church. Right about there, I was sitting right about there, and I remember this feeling inside me was like, lift your hands up. And I'm going, I ain't lifting my hands up. And then the first thought that hit me is, what will they think about me? And I remember hearing this voice say, look around, you're the only one not doing it. You're not going to stand out if you lift your hands. You're going to stand out if you don't. They'll just think you're one of them. And I remember at first, you know, I was like, well, why you got to do that? I mean, what's wrong with this? And I remember at first it was like. Now we call that half-mast. That means someone died. <laughs> Half mass. That means I'm dying. <laughs> I'm in the process of death and worship. Oh, thy kingdom come. All of a sudden, man, it don't matter what anybody thinks. Why? Because as I begin to do that, all of a sudden I sense the presence of God. And I'm like, well, hey, 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 why did I do this all along? And then I remember the dancing ones, you know. And I, I remember sitting there. I didn't dance in the world. There's no way I was going to dance in church. I just didn't dance. And so pride, you know. I remember we had this associate pastor in church. We called him Dancing Don. He was an engineer, a big old tall engineer. And uh, man, the praise and worship would start. And I mean, this guy, he danced like David, you know. I mean, this guy just, man, he looked like, he looked like a combination of Rocky and Peter Pan when he went across the front, man. <laughs> you know, it was just anointed best thing is that it was anointed and one day he came up to me and he looked at me and he said David I had a vision of you dancing all the way across the front of this church and I just smiled at him and in my mind I was thinking it would be a cold day in hell before this man dances across the front of that church you be careful what you say and it wasn't a Probably several months went by, and I stood there, and no, I, I've submitted. I've submitted. And then one day, oh, man, that was back when we were singing these songs like, When the Spirit of the Lord moves on my heart, I will sing like David sang, you know. Back in the 80s. When the Spirit of the Lord, and I just sang, when the Spirit of the Lord moves on my heart, I will clap like David clapped. I will clap. I can clap. I will clap. And then they get to the D word. <laughs> and when the Spirit of the Lord moves on my heart, I will dance like David danced, and I'm clapping.
And then one day, man, something happened. And I thank God for the day it happened. I thank God that something happened inside me. And I was able to yield my physical body fully in worship. I was able to allow my body to worship the Lord. I broke through that pride barrier. And you know what's funny is people have no problem doing this for the idols of the world. They'll jump, shout, dress up, paint their face for a sports figure or a race car driver. Or a, they'll do anything to rejoice and to give glory to men. But when it comes to giving yourself over to worship for God, people are stuck. Pride. So whoever humbles himself as this little child is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself or whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. And verse 6 Everyone remember this. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin. It'd be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he would drown in the depths of the sea. Next time you want to convince someone into a, something they think is wrong and you even try to address it as Christian liberty but in their conscience and in their heart they don't believe it's right but you convince them it's Christian liberty and you make them sin against their own conscience and you lead them away you better be careful. You better be careful. Because God doesn't take lightly someone seducing. <clears throat> young man or young woman, old man or old woman, middle-aged man or middle-aged woman, the next time you try to get one of God's sons or daughters to fornicate with you, and they say no, and you say, oh, come on, God understands. We're going to get married anyway. God's fitting you for a necklace. Oh, Dave, it's all grace. It's all grace. God, don't judge anybody. No, 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 no. It's all grace. You can do anything you want. We're free in Jesus. Yeah, you are. Free to walk in the righteousness of God. Amen. Woe to the world because of offenses. <laughs> woe to the church because of offenses. For offenses must come, but woe to the man by whom the offense comes. If your hand or foot causes you to sin... Cut it off and cast it from you. It's better to enter into life lame or maimed than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. Not purgatory. Everlasting fire. When we say we're playing with fire, we're serious. That's why we want to live our lives not on the edge of carnality, but as far back into spirituality, righteousness, holiness, and truth as we can get. I want to be backed into the corner of the righteousness of God, not out on the edge of can I do this and still maybe make it? What happens when a nation refuses the ways of God? I'm going to read you a story. 
And then you see if you find any correlation between what happened to this nation and what's happening to our nation. This story comes from the book of Isaiah chapter 3. I'm going to read it out of the Message Bible. A little more contemporary rendering. But it kind of makes things a little more relevant to us. Isaiah 3, 1. Just listen to this story. The master, God of the angel armies, is emptying Jerusalem and Judah of all the basic necessities, starting with plain bread and water. Everybody say, it's the economy, stupid. First sign, first sign of impending judgment on a people is a shift in the economy. He's withdrawing police, protection, judges, courts, pastors, and teachers, captains and generals, doctors and nurses, and yes, even repairmen, jack of all trades. A, a poll I read last week said that right now, 82% of Americans agree that we are in a leadership crisis in our nation, both secular and sacred. 82% of us think we're in a leadership crisis. Second, manifestation of impending judgment on a people. The failure of leadership. Do you trust your congressman? Do you trust your leadership in this nation? It's even hard to trust leadership in the church, isn't it? Hmm? It's hard to trust people. Not that we put our trust in man. We put our trust in God. But we ought to be able to find someone faithful enough to at least lead. Verse 4, I'll put little kids in charge of the city. Schoolboys and schoolgirls will order everyone around. Wow. Children now rule the home. Schools. And the sad thing is these children are growing up. And these children are causing a crisis in our workforce. I've read story after story about how the, the unwillingness of young people to work is causing economic crisis in the workforce. Verse 5, people will be at each other's throats, stabbing one another in the back, neighbor against neighbor, young against old, no account against the well-respected. Authority, disrespected, disregarded, strife and contention in relationships. One brother will grab another and say, you look like you've got a head on your shoulders. Do something. Get us out of this mess. And he'll say, man, not me. I don't have a clue. Don't put me in charge of this thing. People refusing the normal responsibilities of life. Verse 8, Jerusalem's on its last legs. Judah is soon cut down for the count. Everything people say and do is at a cross purpose with God. A slap in his face. Let me ask you a question. Is the agenda of America the agenda of God? We are called now a post-Christian nation. That means we used to be in the agenda of God. Now we're in the agenda of man. Now man has been elevated to God. Now man is looked at as supreme ruler. And God is looked at as Grimm's fables, a fairy tale for the weak to use as a crutch to get through life. Because they don't have enough sense to realize it's stupid to believe in an invisible God. 
when there's so much scientific evidence. <laughs> so we see the vision of the nation is no longer a righteous agenda. Brazen, verse 9, in their depravity, they flout their sins like degenerate Sodom. Doom to their eternal souls. They've made their bed, now they'll sleep in it. You know what? We're having now the great debate in the church. You know? Well, I don't believe that's sin. Well, it's been sin for 2,000 years, 4,000 years, 6,000 years. Well, I don't think it is. Why? Because I don't think it is. I don't think it's sin. Brazen in their depravity. They flout their sins like Sodom. That's where we get the word sodomy. It's how homosexuals have intercourse. Now we have churches. I, someone told me the other day they were driving through Marietta and there's a church and they've got a rainbow on their sign which means homosexuals are welcome to come and worship with us here. And there's a new sign. It's the pink equal sign. That is now the symbol. So if you see that symbol, that fluorescent pink equal sign, know what they're saying is this is a homosexual agenda. And they're not ashamed anymore. Neither are adulterers. I'm an equal opportunity offender. I'll offend homosexuals and I'll offend adulterous heterosexuals. Amen. And I'll offend heterosexual fornicators alike. Just like I'll offend liars and drunkards and thieves and, lie, and, and any other depravity or evil. And if you want to try to sanctify your evil, do it somewhere else. Yeah. Believe me, you won't have a problem finding a church that will welcome your sin. You won't. But this church is going to command repentance till Christ returns. I don't care if I'm preaching to the carpet. I'm going to command repentance. I'm going to preach in the wilderness of this culture. Make the way straight for the Lord. I'm going to preach it. And I thank God you're applauding that. And I pray that next week the applause is louder, not softer when I say it. Because you're either being converted into the culture or into the kingdom. One of the two. You're walking in one direction or the other. You, if you try to go both way, you're going to get racked. You're going to do the splits. Now here, everybody say, hey Dave, how about some good news this morning? <laughs> Got one for you. Verse 10. Reassure the righteous that their good living will pay off. But doomed to the wicked, disaster, everything they did will be done to them. Well, here's the good news. Dave, I'm trying to live this thing. I'm trying to walk this thing. I'm trying to lead my family in righteousness. You will be rewarded with good. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. You're going to have an expected end. Of good. That's the good news. Verse 12. Skinny kids terrorize my people. Silly girls bullying them around. My dear people, your leaders are taking you down a blind alley. They're sending you off on a wild goose chase. God enters the courtroom. He takes his place at the bench to judge his people. God calls for order in the court. Hauls the leaders of his people into the dock. You've played havoc with this country. Your houses are stuffed with what you've stolen from the poor. What is this anyway? Stomping on my people, grinding the faces of the poor into the dirt. That's what the master God of the angel army says. God says, 
Zion women are stuck up. Prancing around in their high heels, making eyes at all the men in the street, swinging their hips, tossing their hair, gaudy and garnish in cheap jewelry. The master will fix it so those Zion women will all turn bald, scabby, bald-headed women. The master will do it. The time is coming when the master will strip them of their fancy baubles, the dangling earrings, the anklets, the bracelets, the combs, the mirrors, the silk scarves, the diamond brooches, the pearl necklaces, the rings on their fingers and the rings on their toes, the latest fashions in hats, exotic perfumes, aphrodisiacs, gowns and capes, all the world's finest in fabrics and design. Instead of wearing seductive scents, these women are going to smell like rotten cabbages. Instead of modeling flowing gowns, they'll be sporting rags. Instead of their stylish hairdos, scruffy heads. Instead of their beauty marks, scabs and scars. Your finest fighting men will be killed. And your soldiers left dead on the battlefield. Man, how scary is that for Israel? Hmm? But boy, it's amazing how much of that right now can be seen in our culture. And that makes me want to run to the rock of my salvation. It makes me want to take refuge in the secret place. It makes me want to hide in the shadow of the Almighty. It makes me want to cry out even louder than I've ever cried out before. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth. On earth as it is in heaven. If you're in this church and you want to lead people back into sin, you're going to be fighting me to do it. You're going to be fighting me to do it. If you're in this church and you want to go back into the scum of the world, the filth of this world, you're going to go alone. I ain't going with you. I'm going to hold the line until Jesus returns. I'm going to stand and I'm going to say, your kingdom come. Your will be done. I'm going to take all who want the kingdom with me. I'm going to take everyone who wants a kingdom because I still read my Bible and I still say in Acts 17.30, the times of this ignorance. This is, this is Acts now. We've moved from Isaiah to Acts. And here he's talking about the history of Israel and their foolishness. And he says that the times of this ignorance, God winked at. If the judgments pronounced on Israel for their refusal to walk in kingdom ways, if that judgment was a wink, God help us. Because he says now, verse 30, commandeth, not suggesteth, commandeth all men everywhere. In America, in Europe, in Africa, in Central America, and South America, and Australia, in England, commands men everywhere, on every continent, on every island, commands men everywhere, in every church, in every congregation, commands men everywhere to repent. Why? Verse 31, because he's appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whether he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Prepare your heart for judgment. No, Brother Dave, 
I'm in the New Testament now. There is no judgment. Every man will stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for what he has done in his body on this earth. Every man. His works will be tried by fire. Are your works fireproof? Every motive will be tried by fire. Why are you doing what you're doing? It'll be tried by fire. Why are you doing what you're doing? Will it stand the test of fire? I'm calling myself into account. My God, I don't want to do anything that won't stand the test of fire when it comes to living my life. Will it stand the test of fire? For you will give an account of every idle word. Dave, you're scaring me. Good. Because the fear of God has fled from those churches. Man, when, when, when I experience the depths of his presence, I still hear the angels crying, holy. I still hear the 24 elders saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Holy still means holy. Holy means without sin. Jesus didn't come to sanctify your sin. He came to deliver you from it. Jesus didn't come to license you to live lawless. He came to deliver you from the kingdom of darkness Amen. into the kingdom of his dear son. He called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And there's always the danger of the darkness reemerging and seducing us back. There's always that danger. Well, we're kind of standing where Paul stood this day. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. And others said, we'll hear thee again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them, and this is my favorite part. Howbeit certain men clave to him and believed. I want to be a certain man. I don't want to be the one that is skeptical and says, well, I don't know about that. I don't know about all that stuff. No, no. I want to be a certain one. I want to be one of those certain men that cleave to him. And I want to walk in that. Hallelujah. Can you get some worship guys up here? Thank you, Jesus. This morning in this house, I pray that the kingdom of God would come into your life. That he would reawaken the word inside of each of us. That the word would become so real. His presence would become so dear. I pray that the light of his kingdom would completely, completely illuminate us. Not, we don't want to walk in the shadow of darkness. We don't walk because the scripture says there's no eclipse in him. But he wants the light to come. Give me some worship people up here. Do I got any worship people in here? Come on, guys. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Oh, Jesus.
I'm praying for the spirit of repentance to hit this house. I'm praying for the spirit of repentance to hit this house. Just like it's hitting me. I'm praying for the reality of the kingdom to hit this house just like it's hitting me. I'm praying that the realization, not the ideal, but the real presence of God grips you like a vice. And I pray you awaken every day looking for the adventure that he's called you to walk in that day. Looking for the adventure of the kingdom. Looking for the direction of the Spirit. Not willing to move until you know. Not willing to commit until you know. Not willing to do anything half-heartedly, but with full commitment to the kingdom of God. To the kingdom of God. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. It's hard to preach for a spiritual church in this culture. I know. But I'm doing it anyway. It's hard to reach for the high calling of God where men are content to lay low. But I'm going to preach it anyway. It's hard to convince men against the activity of this earth to move into the secret of his kingdom. But I'm going to preach it anyway. Because there's some of you that say, here I am, Lord. I'll go. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Here I am, Lord. I'll do it. Here I am, Lord. I'll pray the price. Here I am, Lord. I'll answer the call. For some... It'll be moaning and groaning, and for others, it'll be shouting and rejoicing. But he's calling us in. He's calling us in. He's calling us in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Stand up. Stand up. If this message today has struck a chord in your heart to pursue his kingdom in a greater way, then we're going to have a call of commitment to that awakening today. I can't manufacture that in you. I can't make it happen in you. My words can't convince you. Only the spirit of truth can reveal truth. Only the Holy Spirit can convert a human heart. I'm not foolish enough to think Dave can convince anybody to do anything. But if the Holy Ghost has struck a chord in your heart today and you say, I want to advance. I want to advance. I don't care if it's 10 after 12. I want to advance. I don't care. I want to advance. I want to experience the riches of your glory in Christ. I don't want to live a life like I'm living. I want to go deeper. I want to go further. I want to run faster. If that's you, come. Move. Move. If it's you, I can't make it happen. Only God can. I can't create the desire. Only He can. But He's releasing. He's releasing the call. He's releasing the call. The call to come deeper. The call to come out further. And as you come, open your mouth and begin to make your declaration to Him. Begin to make your declaration to Him. Begin to make your commitment. I'm going deeper. I'm going further. Nothing will hold me back. I'm 
going to run with you to the high places. I'm going to soar with you in the high graces. I'm going to run with you, my Lord. I want to walk with you in the Spirit. I want to live with you in the Spirit. I want to move with you in the Spirit, my Lord. I want to walk and obey, live and pray, watching along the way. I want to walk with you. I want to walk with you. I want to live with you. I want to move with you. I want to dance with you. I want to shout with you, my Lord. My Lord. My Lord. My King. I give you everything. All of me. I'm holding nothing back from you. I want to go. will hold me back I will resist every demonic attack I will not be defeated anymore I'll walk in victory that's what you want for me I'll walk I'll walk with you in that triumph I'm gonna run I'm going to run hand in hand with you, arm in arm with you. I'm going to run. I'm going to run. I'm going to run. I'm going to run. I want to go all the way with you, holding back nothing from you. I want to fulfill my call. I give you my all. 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 I'm not holding anything back. I'm not holding anything back, Lord. Take all of me. Take me over. Take me over. Overcome in me. It is He who has overcome the world. Now overcome in me. From glory to glory. From glory to glory. <laughs> From glory to glory, oh Father, we want to run with you. I'd like, I'd like uh, all my team leaders, all my team leaders that say, Dave, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost today. I want you to move out here. I want you to start laying hands on people. All my team leaders, if you're filled with the Spirit today, come out here. Now be careful. Make sure you're holding on to someone. They start to fall. You got you to gotta help them. Hold on to them. Hold on to them. Begin to pray. Begin to pray. I want it all. 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 Not hold nothing back. Not hold nothing back. I want it all. I want it all. I want it all.
change our will for your will our life for your life our ways for your ways we make the divine exchange with you oh your kingdom come and your will be done in my life in my heart Lord, please impart your life to me. I want to live my days in your grace. I want to live my days in that place where you are more real. You're not just an ideal. You are the rock on which I stand. You're the strength of my life. You're the life of my strength. You're my joy. You're my hope. You're my glory. You're my faith. You are my courage to stand. Lord, your wish is my command. I want to live with you. Mm. I want to live with you. 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 Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus.
Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Not blessed are they who hunger and thirst for this world. Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness. For they shall be filled. <laughs> Hallelujah. They shall be filled. My God, they shall be filled. Hallelujah. your appointments in prayer this week because the Lord has so many glorious things he wants to show you he has so many secrets he wants to tell you he's so looking forward to meeting you in the secret place his favorite thing to do is meet you in the secret place that's his favorite thing to do and there you tell him your secrets and he tells you his that's why it's called the secret place There'll be things he says to you that you're not allowed to tell other people. And there'll be things you say to him that he'll never tell another person. That's why it's called the secret place. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Hallelujah. And I will say of the Lord, what will you say? He is my refuge. He's my fortress. He's my strong tower. In Him I will believe. Don't you know a thousand will fall at my right hand? Ten thousand will fall at my left hand. Lord, you've become my tower, my prince of peace. Mm. No enemy will stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. Mm. Wow, presence of the Lord. To go out and to come in with him. I charge you this week to go God inside minded. I charge you to wake up tomorrow morning saying that the Spirit, the same Spirit. <laughs> if the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in me. I believe it was Acts chapter 11, I believe, where Simon was called to Joppa. And he entered that house. And as he began to speak the words of life, it says, The Spirit fell on them as on us in the beginning. I pray the Spirit of God falls on you this week, just like he's been falling on men since the day of Pentecost. I pray every day we awaken freshly baptized in the presence of God, rather to, re ready, ready to go out and declare the hope that is within us. And to call men out of darkness back into his marvelous light. Amen. It's a wonderful place to live. It's a wonderful life to live when we live in the kingdom. We love you. We bless you. Thank you so much for your commitment to the Lord.